Okay, welcome to the 46th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking to Martin Lloyd Elliott. Martin has worked for 31 years in full time private practice as a chartered psychologist and psychotherapist, during which he has worked with over 1500 clients. He also coaches business executives and management teams in cutting edge uh, leadership skills, specializing in the creation and development of super teams. Principal teachers and influencers are James Hollis, Petrushka Clarkson, Carl Jung, James Hillman, Joseph Campbell, and many others. Welcome, Martin. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, a pleasure, a pleasure. Uh, really great to to have you on. Uh, we met for the first time in the summer uh, on a Mankind Project um, gathering. And yeah, we were having this discussion. I was like, oh, I'd love to speak to you on my podcast. So thank you for agreeing to, to come and speak. My pleasure. So the, the first question I like to ask people is just to introduce a little bit about yourself. How is it you got into this work and, you know, into doing what you now do? Mm. I, I blame Arthur Conan Doyle. When I was a boy, I loved Sherlock Holmes. And although I didn't realize it, clearly Conan Doyle was a psychologist by any other name. So I was, I think, absorbed by close observation and the whole idea of deduction. My first, I guess, introduction to logic, but also the fact that although I didn't have the language at the time, he was so good at exploring human shadow. Mm -hmm. Why did people do what they did? What was going on? This, this endless repetition of the theme, which is that people are not as they appear and people have secrets and hidden aspects which are often very dark in their personalities or their characters or their behaviors and that was in turn my first introduction to the endless paradox of being and the idea that all the world lives within one mm -hmm. and that one has endless choices about which part of oneself one lets loose on the world or not mm -hmm. So that was the start. And eventually I discovered psychology. And as soon as I started reading psychology, I realized, okay, this is territory I'm really interested to inhabit and to begin to study. And it's never stopped ever since. Right. Wow. Wow. I didn't, yeah, interesting. I I can't remember when I last read some Sherlock Holmes or saw one of the Sherlock Holmes films. Um, yeah, that's yeah, really love that that idea. So. so I guess where I would like us to begin the conversation is around, you know, for you to introduce what you understand about trauma. Um, what is it and how does it impact us as humans, please, Martin? Mm, that's a very big question about <laughs> a very, very big subject. It's a uh... So trauma is as complicated as human beings are. Mm -hmm. And I would offer that, I mean, it's very obvious, human beings are the most complicated of all the creatures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So trauma is 10,000 different things. If I think about all the great teachers who are writing and thinking and speaking about trauma, I suppose what they have in common is the idea that things can happen to us which are either very dramatic, something that's catastrophic, an accident, a disaster, a loss, a, a physical injury, a, a traumatic event, which fractures our relationship with the world at that moment. Um, Carol Gilligan came up with the idea of a, a trauma being a, a fracture with a significant relationship. Mm. So when something extremely impactful, either emotionally or physical or intrapsychically happens to us, there is always a consequence. And the nature of that consequence is one of the ways of thinking about trauma. It may not be that the 
focus needs to be on the event. It may be really that we need to think about what then happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. How does the person who has experienced this event process uh, what has happened or not? And then what are the consequences for them and the wider circle of their influence around them? So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there can be what therapists sometimes call, call chronic uh, trauma, which is an, a continued exposure to anything from neglect to abuse. Uh, I've worked in the past with patients who grew up, for example, in Beirut during the war, where there was a constant fear of um, death, attack, kidnap, you name it. This terrible, pervasive fear that filled the air, which gets into people sometimes. So it can be chronic. And that's nebulous and often strange to experience and can be like a fog that takes up residence and you hardly notice it's coming. But the consequences can be as dramatic or as disruptive to your well-being as seeing your sibling die in a car accident when you're a child. So what we, what I think, I be careful to differentiate between saying I and we. I think that trauma is a word that's trying to cover a whole variety of different subcategories of definition. But it is something where the consequence is always negative and costly and often painful mm -hmm. and which has some disruptive side effect, which means my ability to live well, to thrive, has been interfered with in a way that really costs me or costs the ones I love or, or beyond that even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great description uh, of trauma. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, when we were talking about a month ago, when we were talking about the potential of doing the podcast, you, you mentioned this phrase that James Hollis uh, had talked about, which is to actively choose a career in politics is patho pathological. Would you be able to to expand a little bit mm. about that, please? Sure. So, of course, this is my interpretation of what yeah. uh, James was saying. And uh, hopefully you might get to speak to him if, uh, if things go mm. uh, as I'd like them to. But it seems to me, and I'm sure most of your rational thinking listeners will agree, that to be successful in politics now, there are a set of requirements which are very shadowy. Mm -hmm. uh, if I put it this way, if somebody was to actually tell the truth, they would be unelectable. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> it's, it's a worry. A it's a worry and it's a paradox because what I want is for great leaders mm -hmm. to be in charge and for me, a prerequisite of being a great leader is having the courage to speak the truth, mm. tell the truth. As Jordan Peterson says, at least, at least don't lie. Mm. Whereas it seems to me one of the pathological requirements of high office is that you lie all the time, probably starting with lying to yourself, which is a side effect of narcissism. And of course, it's a highly narcissistic uh, career these days as well. So I think what James Hollis is really pointing out is that if you willingly put yourself forward for public office, you know what you're taking on and you know what's going to be required of you. And that to kind of enthusiastically throw yourself into that snake pit seems a pretty odd thing to do. Um, it may sound a bit cynical, I've spoken to people who work in government and they collectively declare that when they were young and naive, they went into politics really with a heart in a good place and with a determination to, to make a difference and to 
make things better. Um, and that quite quickly, once they were in the machine, in the system, they got perverted, they got distorted, they got uh, converted into some kind of betrayal of self. But I'm not sure if that's always true. It seems to me as a collective, most people, not all, but most people who decide to go into uh, a career where they're seeking power and high office are often psychologically in quite an odd place at the beginning that sets them off on that particular path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That looks like it landed somewhere with you. <laughs> yeah, because I'm just thinking of, uh, I've met people who were at school with Boris um, and they told me what it was like that he, he already had that persona then you know entertaining people walking through windsor and he would be entertaining you know and he had the, the throng around him so he had yeah from a a young age that ability to to do that um yeah um yeah i'm sure i could go off on a thousand different tangents here because i've been reading a lot of nick's work um and I, I spoke to Nick in London a couple of weeks ago, Nick Duffel, about his work, Wounded Leaders, and similar things, actually, similar um, ideas. I don't know if this fits, but a philosophy I work with, mm -hmm. maybe one of the central tenets upon which I base my dialogue with my clients, is that the the mystery and the magic of the human experience includes a preset, a bias towards healing. Mm -hmm. I think our extraordinary Darwinian development has included endless improvements on our capacity to try and repair. Mm -hmm. If one looks at the extraordinary capacity of the body to heal and to repair, surely the psyche is on the same trajectory. So it seems to me we are problem solving creatures and we are solution finding creatures. Mm -hmm. And that if we've had some kind of trauma or deficit in our childhood, one way or another, we will be um, motivated to seek out some kind of repair for that. And if not a repair, then maybe a compensation. And if not a compensation, then the shadow trouble is an acting out. Yeah, yeah. So if I am somebody who really needs a lot of attention because I haven't had enough good attention when I'm a child, I may seek a career where I'm going to get lots of attention. Mm -hmm. But what is really my motive? Is it revenge? Is it uh, envy? You know, what's driving me into that? seeking of the spotlight being on me is it that actually as as Jung called narcissists you know am i a hungry ghost mm. just endlessly trying to fill the space inside me but no matter how many people i consume or how much affection or adoration i i receive it's never enough and so i've got this kind of insatiable questing inside me that never gets fulfilled for example so the acting out problem is that if I've got some kind of psychological wound and I'm trying to repair it at other people's expense, everyone's likely to suffer, including me, because I won't get what I need and I'll be using and exploiting and abusing other people on the way up the greasy pot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when it's a family, obviously it will affect the family if your father in the family if you're a leader in a community, it's going to affect the community. What about if you're a leader of a country? And I, when we were speaking to Nick Duffel a few weeks ago, he mentioned the, and I, I'm not sure if it's the current leaders, but he said 52 out of 92 of the leaders of the world have been educated, not only boarding school, but in the UK, in England. So 52 out of 92. So what is the impact of having those leaders 
who have been maybe you know have this narcissist or you know I, yeah i'm just intrigued by that well good question truthful answer of course i have no idea mm -hmm. and again a paradox we're all the same mm -hmm. and we're all unique yeah. and one of the extraordinary areas of exploration that psychology is still absolutely involved in is individual differences mm -hmm. and how 10 different people can have a similar experience and have 10 completely different outcomes or different ways of processing or different ways of uh, responding or perhaps acting out the consequence of whatever that experience is. So I'm cautious when we approach generalizations about, well, if you go to British public school and you're sent away from your home, that the consequence is X. Yeah. I think that's oversimplistic. But I do think it's worth noting that there are a lot of people in very senior influential positions who have been through this very particular way of educating, which includes being separated from the family. Mm -hmm. And I wonder about that. So you might argue, just to play devil's advocate, that actually to have the toughness required mm -hmm. to be in politics, to make those decisions that are going to be unpopular with, let's say, on average, half the population, mm -hmm. um, that may have very, very serious consequences in terms of the outcomes of decisions and people suffering or people being killed in, in war, all these terrible things. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you need to have a kind of brutalized adolescence, if not childhood, to give you the suit of armor required to um, to be able to fulfill your function as the leader stroke fall guy. Mm -hmm. But equally, as a therapist, of course, I think that's all pathological. <laughs> I think that um, if, you're, if you're put into a system which disconnects you from your emotional intelligence or closes it down, or causes you to disassociate because you're traumatized, mm -hmm. then all of your leadership decisions later are going to be through the prism of your protective systems that you've established while you are being traumatized or while you're suffering abandonment or separation, anxiety, or whatever it is that is the consequence of being sent away from home. So it seems to me, on balance, more likely, if we were going to steer towards generalizations, mm -hmm. that there's going to be some negative fallout. Yeah. And if one actually looks at the people who are leading mm -hmm. the countries of the world, I mean, I do feel quite anxious when I see who's in charge all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I'm not concerned. I'm not convinced that there are very many enlightened leaders in the positions of authority that I wish they were. Yeah. That was bad English, but I think you get what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I definitely get that. And yeah, I, yeah, I, I so agree at the moment. I was listening to Thomas Hubel talk to Gabor Mate um, on the Collective Healing Trauma Summit um, over the weekend. And and I also listened to Gabor Mate speak uh, on Joe Rogan's podcast a few weeks ago, and him talking about leadership and trauma. Um, yeah, and he was saying very similar things. Um, so yes, I I can definitely uh, resonate with that. I mean, moving the the conversation because I know we're limited for time today, but obviously we can come back and speak later. Um, is we've spoken a little bit about boarding school but i'd love for you to talk a bit about leadership boarding school syndrome and you know does it create great leaders as you said you know obviously it's all individual or does it create you know a shadow side that most of us, because I feel in talking about boarding school, most people see it's not relevant because they didn't go. But I guess what I'm interested in, a bit like um, uh, Susan Zedike, who I spoke to a few uh, months ago, to ask the question, well, let's just ask. I don't know if I'm right, but yeah, 
what is the impact is it does it make great leaders does is there a shadow side to it well when you put it like that i have to say maybe and probably <laughs> okay um and we should be careful about our definitions you know what is this thing called a great leader yeah what are what are our criteria for even beginning to measure that mm -hmm. if one looks at the history of the establishment of boarding schools of private schools in britain ironically of course originally they were charitable yeah. um, and they were part of the church mm -hmm. but in in the victorian era they were very much a part of the whole machinery of empire where a lot of parents were abroad doing their <clears throat> dark work in the name of of the empire and their children were fobbed off and institutionalized and industrialized really it was a kind of industrial machine mm -hmm. to provide overconfident uh de uh personalized unemotional vassals mm -hmm. of a system which was designed to perpetuate itself which included you know brutality and exploitation and the perpetuation of a system which was avaricious on a vast scale mm -hmm. so if one looks at india you know the East India Company, the history of the East India Company is just shocking. And most British people don't know about what the British did. But we were we were pirates. Mm -hmm. we, we looted the whole beautiful nation of India and all its different states on a grand scale. And we we produced this archetype. Well, it's a kind of archetype. It's a shadowy um, officer class whose job it was to perpetuate the whole system. Mm -hmm. um, so is that a great leader? I mean, well, it's a very shadowy leader. They may be effective in the sense they have authority. Mm -hmm. They made atrocious decisions and uh, uh, decisions that uh, cost so many people so much mm -hmm. livelihood, well-being, humiliation, degradation, impoverishment i mean just shocking we weren't the only ones doing it of course the mm -hmm. most european powers were busy at it as well yeah. which doesn't make it any better but we got particularly good at doing it mm -hmm. um so we were brigands and pirates on a grand scale across the globe um and the the officer class which is still present in our public school system to some degree although mm -hmm. it's been significantly challenged now, mm -hmm. um, was, was like a club, which if you were a member of, there were certain things which the whole system, the whole of society, made more likely to happen if you'd been to one of the so-called big, powerful, great schools. You had a network of people who would make sure you were, in, you were included in positions of authority mm -hmm. and therefore moved up the ranks into being a leader. And so the whole system kept itself going in a in a self-fulfilling prophecy. So is that a, a place where great leaders are made? You know, again, we have to say, what is a great leader? I would I would say Mahatma Gandhi was a, you know, one of the greatest leaders of the last mm -hmm. century. And he knew enough about the British system to play it at its own game. Yeah. Yeah. Um but does it make shadowy leaders? Undoubtedly. I mean, let's go back to the drawing board. Mm. Everyone has shadow. Yes. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And that shadow will manifest in our lives one way or another. Mm. That which mm. we deny, repress, or hide will come to bite us and the people around us, by the way. Yes. If we're not attending to it. The trouble with being in a position of seniority or authority is that when your shadow comes out, it's more likely to harm more people. Mm -hmm. And what mostly are trainings in becoming leaders completely exclude is any ownership of shadow. Mm -hmm. So my 
you know, wish would be that as part of our education system, never mind the bloody private school system, mm -hmm. part of our our education system should be really teaching people about this thing called shadow. Yes. Part of you that is capable of being very dark and brutal, mm -hmm. terrible, terrible and terrifying. And, and how when one is moving through one's life, whether it's being the leader in a relationship of two or the leader of an organization with thousands of employees or the leader of a country, consciousness about the potential of shadow to disrupt and to corrupt should be front and center of one's education. But I'm not sure how soon that's going to happen. Well, my wish is in the next few years to be honest martin because i feel it, it has to happen yes but that that's me but if whether it will i i don't know but it's yeah and i love what you're saying because uh, listening to jordan peterson he says you know a th really important thing is to read about the dark history of uh humanity to know just what we are capable of absolutely and then if you look at the famous experiments of people like milgram and Zimbardo, which are now kind of legend in their own right, mm -hmm. any human being, given the right circumstance, can do the most unspeakable things to other human beings. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, yeah. the switch in our inner moral compass and our ethics that can be moved almost effortlessly, given the right environment or the right uh, coercive circumstance, is terrifying. Yeah, yeah. The thin veneer of civilization. Mm, 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 mm. Perfectly reasonable people living side by side. Neighbors who've known each other for years in Serbia can the next day be killing each other. I mean, it's horrifying what all of us is capable of. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, it kind of reminds me as well of uh, Rutger Bregman's book, Humankind. I don't know if you've read mm. uh, and that kind of that helps me to balance that out as well. That's that actually we have the propensity for darkness and uh, the propensity for, for good. Um, um, and so for me, part of my work is really exploring the expansion of choice. Mm. But most of us, and the neuropsychologists kind of confirm this, are using well-worn pathways, mm. old patterns of behavior and thinking, and making the same old choices most of the time, day after day. So we become lazy, mm. and we forget that we have an unlimited number of choices. Mm. And we're, by limiting ourselves, we may also be stopping ourselves growing. So not only do we all have blind spots, but we all have preset patterns of attitude, behavior, belief, which are so self-limiting. And that really the exciting thing for me is reminding myself that I always have another choice. Mm -hmm. And to try and infuse my clients with that idea that there is always an alternative choice. And to start questioning all our habits, our habits of behavior, our habits of thought, our habits of um, inner dialogue, mm. which we inhabit and, and accommodate uh, often without questioning and to great cost to ourselves, at great cost to ourselves. Mm. Mm. I love that, the unlimited number of choices. And it makes me reflect reading Nick Duffel's work saying this talks about the strategic survival personality that an ex border will put up uh, in order to survive. And him saying that one of the strategic ways is to just um, never be able to say they're wrong, which we've seen in Tony Blair or we've seen in Boris Johnson recently. Oh, no, you know, I wasn't even at the party. And then there's a photo of him at the party. Well, maybe I was this. Um, and there's almost like by doing that, by saying I can never be wrong, they can never really learn on one level. And therefore they don't have that unlimited 
number of choices. Yes. So part of the system you're describing perpetuates the inflated ego, mm -hmm. which is always compensatory. And so it's on the pathway to megalomania. Mm -hmm. So it's a form of egomania in the sense that you have to keep, the, the person in that state has to keep finding more evidence to justify their view of themselves that they've decided to adopt because the opposite is terrifying. It's a kind of collapse of identity and a collapse of self. So one falls into the trap of endlessly narrowing one's focus mm -hmm. and perspective and doing the exact opposite of the great kind of wisdom philosophy, which is, I may well be wrong. Yeah. And um, I know I've got blind spots everywhere. And the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know, or the, the less I know, you know that, that ancient truth. But if I'm really committed to growing, I know that that's a, that's a daunting task because it's never ending and will never be achieved. And I'd better be, you know, I better be ready to be humble. Mm. Um, James Hollis speaks beautifully about great leadership encompassing a combination of magnificence and humility. Mm. Feet mm. on the ground solidly connected to the earth and nature and people and what they are experiencing so empathy and compassion and all those qualities but equally to allow one's imagination to soar and to be creative and visionary and expansive and to be in the in the brilliance and the genius of of the human mind if one is um on a path to wisdom and enlightenment as opposed to self-aggrandizement and uh, kind of e envious exploitation of others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, which maybe that's my what my sense is at the moment. That's what we're stuck in is that self-aggrandizement. It's, you know... I've seen this quite a lot over the last couple of years during the COVID times of um, the contracts going to their friends, self-aggrandizement to their, you know, rather than to the people. Um, and I, I was just watching last night the film The Big Short, which is about the 2008 uh, financial collapse in America. Uh, and at the end, he says, well, you know, everyone gets prosecuted, they all put put away and he says actually no that's not true only one person was punished in any way and it's almost like the collateral damage filters down um because nick duffel says this that the patterns of our leaders filters down but the money doesn't we get that impression that money filters down it's like no that's not the case and that's you, right um so, yeah. So I'm aware we've got about five minutes left of this, you know, and I was just thinking, oh, I could, we could start branching off into the king archetype. I was just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just aware of time wise, in this next five minutes, is there something you would love to just share to condense down what you've spoken about today? Well, I haven't spoken about it yet, but mm -hmm. it's always in the room, as it were, when I'm thinking and working. And that's the idea of the heart mm -hmm. being the center. Mm -hmm. And that I believe great leadership absolutely comes from the heart. So inspirational leaders, 
people often talk about loving. And so the loving energy is the connecting energy and the connection desire lies at the heart of the human experience. When things are going well, we're making deep connection with other people. And so it seems to me that our capacity for thinking is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And we are, as a species, where we are for good and for worse uh, because of our capacity to think. But it's through our feeling realm and through our um, ability to connect through emotion and to communicate emotion and to harmonically resonate with other human beings at an emotional level that we really inspire. So for me, and this is a very big subject squeezed into a couple of sentences, the, the ideal, what I'm working towards, what I'm trying to inspire in my clients, is where the heart is very present in the decision-making process. Mm. There's, a, there's a lot of cliche and kind of platitudes spoken about head versus heart mm -hmm. and i don't think it's reasonable to to split it like that mm -hmm. i think the heart is always involved somewhere even if it's being crushed or cut off mm -hmm. uh that our intelligence both as individuals and in dialogue we think better when we're in conversation our collective intelligence should be informed and guided by the compass of the heart and that when that's true, then from that combination of, of intellect and, and deep wisdom, the logos and the heart, we haven't got time to talk about logos now, but that's another yeah. whole story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then we're likely to be more authentic in the way we show up. We're likely to be more congruent. And that if we're more congruent, then the quality of the dialogue is going to be improved. And if people really feel heard and understood, then if one's in a position of leadership, even if it's only as a father to a child, mm -hmm. that relationship is going to go better mm -hmm. because the people involved are using more of their innate and learned wisdom in the moment mm -hmm. rather than doing what I observe a lot of people in actual leadership doing, which is just taking old archive material and superimposing it on the present as if it was going to fit. Mm -hmm. So falling back on old cliches or old platitudes and just endlessly repeating them. And if you, you know, this awful reality, if you watch politicians now on television, you can tell they've been briefed to say three sentences and they just keep saying them, whatever you ask them, there's no dialogue whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's anti-dialogue. And therefore anti-connection and if you've got no connection then immediately mistrust is activated mm -hmm. and if you're in an environment where nobody's trusting anyone mm -hmm. your whole circle begins to disintegrate mm -hmm. which is again the opposite of what happens when humans are really flourishing when they're really doing well Mm -hmm. And you you made reference in the in the introduction. Thank you for that, by the way, to this idea of super teams, which I'm very interested in. Mm -hmm. And if one thinks about super teams, whether it be a, an Olympic rowing four, or the SAS going into operation as a team of four, mm -hmm. or an operating theatre team where everything goes like clockwork, the thing about super teams is they're all finely tuned to each other. They can all read each other. They know what each other's feeling as well as thinking. And that's what separates average performing teams from super performing teams. Mm. That capacity to really be in resonance, to be in tune with each other. Mm. And what I observe is disharmony. Now, again, it's a phrase that's used all over the place, probably inaccurately sometimes. But if you imagine that what you want for a humming leadership team mm -hmm. to really make wise decisions and make good choices, is that the starting point is that they're all really finely tuned to each other. Mm 
Mm. They're making good music together. Yeah. And I don't see that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. As you speak, I could ask many more questions here, but I'm aware that we're at our, our boundary of uh, 10 to. Uh, so I won't ask those questions. So I'll have to wait <laughs> for another time. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for, you know, I, I realize it's short today, but it's been amazing. I really learned so much. Um, and I have many more questions. Uh, and like we said, we probably could speak for four hours. <laughs> I'm sure we could. Um, so, yeah. Uh, how do people learn more about you or you know, read some of your, your books? Can they go to Amazon or do you, are they on your website? No, my books are all ancient history, okay. all when I was young. And not not anything to do with really what I'm speaking about now. Okay. I am working on a couple of books and hopefully those will be along soon. Great. Um, uh, there's a film online that people can watch where I interview at length James Hollis mm. uh, with another colleague. It's, a, it's an hour and a half conversation. I think we filmed 14 hours and it was very difficult <laughs> reducing it down to an hour and a half. Wow. Agony, actually. Um, and there you hear more of my ideas, but mostly James Hollis speaking. Mm. And um, I've got a website which has got a few things on it, but not very many. The website, by the way, is 12 years old, mm. and therefore I have hair in the pictures, which is rather embarrassing. And the only reason I haven't changed it is because I'm so tech hopeless. I haven't worked out how to update my website, which I will, as a result of this conversation, commit to doing. <laughs> There's a leadership decision splendid splendid well i'll put the link to your website in and if i can uh i'll have a look now for the interview uh and i'll put that as a link as well below so people can can watch that um, but uh thank you so much it's been a real pleasure uh and yeah an honor to speak to you thank so, you you too thank you, martin okay bye for now